and welcome everybody to the first episode of Addiction and Mental Health Mythbusters, the show where we are trying to shed light on the facts of addiction and mental health to keep people from being ashamed and hiding. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting people talking. So uh, my name is Meg and I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor. I work in the field of addiction and thanks to the grace of God, I haven't had to have a drink since 2008. Our show today is going to be on addiction. Is it a sin? Is it a disease? Is it a mental health? And since those questions are too big for me alone, I have Brian with me, who's going to help us discuss uh, these concepts. Brian uh, is a certified national certified counselor. He has his master's in clinical mental health, and he also um, has a degree in Christian counseling. So hello, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Meg, for having me on here. You um, think? <laughs> Maybe. <yeah. laughs> well, I can tell you. You're, you're addressing a topic that's very difficult to understand and controversial. Um, I hope that your listeners, as we go through this, um, are realizing we're, you're not trying to get to a definite answer. Uh, you're just trying to bring awareness to something that is as difficult to understand as this. Um, and I know your goal is just to help people become open-minded. Um, starting conversations about mental health, addiction, and other challenges that you're passionate about. So um, hopefully we can start that conversation today. Yeah, exactly. That is, uh, you know, the whole goal is to get people talking. So the people listening, uh, your job is to uh, share this video and uh, talk about the concepts. You will have the ability to email me with any thoughts you have on the show, um, any suggestions for improving it, and any topics you'd like addressed in the future. Um, like Brian said, um, um, one of the keys to this whole program is um, approaching these things with an open mind and an open heart. And I think uh, this quote is actually in the big book, right, Brian? Yep. Um, and it uh, is, there is a principle which a bar of, against all information, which is proof against all arguments and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. I love that. That so describes me when I first tried to get sober. I uh, really had a hard time understanding um, why I was stuck in this cycle. And wow. so hopefully today we will help other people who are struggling. Brian, you also are in recovery, correct? Yeah, I was just thinking when you said that. Uh, so I've been sober since 2017, so just over five years. Awesome. I've been in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous since 2008 very steadily. Uh, by God's grace, though, um, I did get sober just a few years later. Awesome. More experience, Meg, more experience. I know. I was in and out for five years, so believe me, I get it. I totally get the experience thing. And speaking of experience, um, experts. So I put this in because I have a real pet peeve when people say that term experts. Oh, well, the experts say, I don't think so. But here I am not depending on just my opinion. So any information I show, there will be a quotation around it with a name. And on my YouTube page, you will see the links to all these different references. So you can check it out and look at the facts and make your own decisions. You don't have to just take my opinion for it. Okay? Well, and Meg, can I jump in on this too? Um, one of the reasons you asked me on here was for the biblical perspective. And so something exactly. that you've had me kind of look at is having gone through seminary and, and had the specialty in Christian counseling. Um my expert opinion or non-expert opinion <laughs> or any beliefs I'm going to throw out there um, when we talk religion and sin or any, some of these concepts that come out, there's always differing viewpoints. And yeah. so um, I'm going to be as open-minded on that as I can be. Talking about experts. I'm talking about the clinical data that I'm going to present um, 
the diagrams of the brain, the functional MRI information that talks about the disease concept of it. That's really more where the experts, um, so-called, um, are actually clinical researchers who have published papers. And that's what you're going to be able to, as an audience, click on and make your own decisions about it. But thank you for clarifying that, Brian. And speaking of sin, um, you know, when we first talked about this, Brian, you're like, oh, why don't you just pick the biggest controversy, Meg? And of course, I was like, yeah. So I just went and got the definition out of Webster's in a, in a moral act to be, um, I can't, to be, I can't see my slide. To be a transgression against divine law. Thank you. Yes, seeing. our little pictures are covering it. So <laughs> good. Okay. I'm glad you know. So um, can you help us better understand the biblical point of view of sin? I mean, that's Webster's opinion on sin, but from a Christian perspective, what is sin? Sure. I'm glad that we have four hours to do this <laughs> podcast. Um, yes. So, in Megan, going over this, and, and the Bible is so much on top of this subject, right? And, and the whole reason for Jesus coming was to defeat sin and death. Um, it was difficult to pick from, but I did one of the parts I wanted to bring up was Romans 14, and we have Paul, mm -hmm. and specifically 1423, and I'll kind of flush out some of the other parts, but he states in 1423, whatever is not from faith is sin, and that's a very penetrating comment mm -hmm. to make, um, and I think because it goes to the root of all sinful actions and attitudes, and namely, that's a failure to trust God. Uh, the reason why I think this is so devastating in as a comment is that it sweeps away all of our lists of do's and don'ts. Yeah. And it makes anything from preaching the house painting uh, really a candidate for sin, right? Yes. Um, and I think that's where we get down to God looking at the heart of us as individuals. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then he goes through in 14, he's addressing um, nothing is it unclean in itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean, you know, and, and he talks about, so this is a situation where believers thought it was wrong to eat meat, right. they were vegetarians, while others thought all foods were pure and they ate anything. Right. Um, some were teetotalers, others drank wine. Right. So Paul agreed with those who saw that all things are pure in themselves, but something was more important to Paul. And that was, you know, making Roman believers um, was more important to Paul than, than making all Roman believers into meat eaters or wine drinkers, right? He wanted groups to walk in love. Right. And so when he's talking about the conscience here, um, is he saying that everything is is okay. And I don't think that's what he's saying. Um, I think he's saying if you believe something is okay, then it's okay. No. What he's saying is if you believe something is not okay, then it's not okay for you. And so what he's asking us to do is strive to conform our conscience to the law of God. Right. And it's like, I can remember uh, the, is, year I drank, uh, the year I drank the most, I read the Bible cover to cover. Yeah. And I knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew it in my heart. And I knew, and the Bible said, do not get drunk. And I was like, well, I guess uh, I'm getting drunk every day. And it was so frustrating for me because it, it felt like it wasn't a choice. It wasn't a choice anymore. I really didn't have a choice. And so I knew I was sinning, but I was stuck in a cycle. Does that make it, sense? It does. It does. And so... You know, and, and this whole thing, I think what Paul is trying to do here for the Romans is he's redefining sin. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's trying to say that it, it can't be defined by terms of mere acts like eating or drinking. Right. Um, it needs to be defined by its root. And so an act of eating 
may or may not be sinful according to whether it springs from love. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is yet a deeper root, and that is, you know, the lack of love in our actions and being considerate of our brothers. So I know this doesn't quite go into the topic of what we're talking about, but I think it's important to understand that um, sin is looked at in so many different ways. And right. where Paul's trying to get to is the idea that it's a matter of your heart. And I agree. Um, in my drinking, I've known for a long time it was wrong, mm -hmm. right? And I think anyone who's going to be drawn to this that maybe has a problem with alcohol is, is going to feel the same way. They're going to say, I know it's wrong, like you just said, but I can't stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's just some of, again, what I saw, and that's just Paul defining it's not about eating and it's not about drinking Meg, right it's no. not about doing this or doing that it's about is my conscience clear before god right as a sin or not a sin right i'm uh, i had this minister who said sin will take you farther than you plan to go keep you longer than you plan to stay and cost you more than you thought you would ever pay and you know for me uh that's exactly what alcohol did and, uh, and then when I got sober for a while, I dabbled in shopping. And that is one thing when we're talking about addiction, uh, for the audience, I want to clarify, there are, uh, all kinds of addictions. Um, the one most people think of is alcohol and drugs, but there is also pornography, um, sex, shopping, food. I mean, anything like Brian is saying that is habitual and you know it's coming between you and god is a problem did i get that right is that right brian did i yep. get that yep okay absolutely so you're right it's that idea that whether it's eating meat or drinking or shopping if you know it's wrong or you believe it's wrong but you go ahead and do it anyways yep. instead of denying yourself um and avoid what you think might be sin then in a sense, in our hearts, we're condemned and we're guilty of sin, right? Right, Because we're convicted of that and we do it anyways. Yeah. And I mean, I think the interesting part about all of this is there is the component, how we feel about ourselves, but also then how the world makes us feel. And there is a lot of shame and guilt and stigma associated with addiction and mental illness. So how do you counsel somebody, Brian, who's struggling with this whole guilt and shame and coming to terms with how to reach out and get help? What do you say to them? Sure. And, and I think it's important to clarify, I'm not doing pastoral counseling. Mm -hmm. So as a national certified counselor um, and, and doing the professional counseling on that end, it's important that I try to understand where the client's beliefs are. Yes. Um, as a counselor, I don't want to put my beliefs on a person. So it's imperative that my job is to kind of flush out what they believe. Yeah. Um, and what others have impressed upon them. And so, you know, that can be just as damaging sometimes is the views that others have been impressed upon um, oh, them. Yes. And that's where a lot of the guilt and shame comes. Um, so I think as a counselor, it's more understanding where they maybe have faulty beliefs in their views or where their strain is coming from, right. uh, the guilt and the shame. And so really going to the Bible um, with a client, discussing what it says can help them to understand what they believe. And I think that's really kind of what we spoke about before. Mm -hmm. It's what do you believe about this, right? Right. Um, because so much of this can be, is it a sin to drink? Is it a sin not to drink? <laughs> right, right. And really, for me, it was coming between me and God. And yes. they say sin separates. And for me, drinking made me, I mean, I'm kind of an odd duck. I actually went to get help because my drinking had separated me from God. I had a relationship with God, thanks to my husband. And and all of a sudden, my drinking had just exploded, and I felt completely alone and lost. And so I actually went because I had lost that relationship. 
And it wasn't just with God. It was also with anybody. I felt so alone. I could be in a room of people, and you probably relate to this, and just feel so unable to be honest with anybody, even myself. That's probably who I lied to the most was myself. Yes. You know, it was just such a dark place to be. And anybody who's out there who's struggling with addiction um, or a hidden mental illness will totally relate to what we're saying because it is such a lonely place to be. And so I think one of the frustrations for families is, and friends is, you know, they're like, well, if it's a sin, why can't they just stop? Right. You know, if you love me, you'd stop. And that's where we're going to move on to our next one. So sin, uh, before we close this one out, it's like you said, it's an immoral act. If you believe it is, and then there is breaking the law. Like I knew when I was drinking at 12, I was breaking the law. So, I mean, that one was kind of clear. And we know hurting others is unacceptable. And when we can't stop the behavior. So uh, let's move on to disease. Now, like I said earlier, um, addiction, well, alcoholism actually, has been defined as a disease since 1956. And um, some people are totally behind this concept of it being a disease. And some people yes. like our mentor <laughs> absolutely despise it because um, they think it makes it too simplified. Oh, it's a disease. So let's just give them a pill and get it fixed. And we know that there is so much more to it. But I think for people who are in the midst of it, or people, more importantly, who have family members, understanding the uh, physiological component is important. Yes. And so the definition of disease, so we're all on the same page, is a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant, especially one that has a known cause, a distinctive group of symptoms, signs, and anatomical changes. So let's take a look at how... Uh, addiction. So the addicted brain. So I'll give you a little crash course on uh, brain physiology. So um, I don't know about you, Brian, but I don't like cake, but I love, uh, as you know, because you've seen me eat the icing off of cake. I love the icing. And when I take the icing, it sends a signal to my brain to release dopamine, which is kind of like the good vibes part of the brain. And, um, and that goes into this area, which is known as our like pleasure center. And this is where the brain then absorbs that dopamine and tells the rest of the body that we like this, that this is good. And uh, the problem is, is when you take something like, uh, <laughs> I love this guy. So this is your brain on, like, say, meth, because meth actually increases your dopamine levels 500%. And your brain does not, isn't that crazy? 500%. Yes. I mean, it leaves ice cream and uh, frosting in the dust. So, <laughs> of course, the person has an immense high, but the brain uh, is needs to be fairly stable. And so what it does is because it can't handle these large swings in dopamine, it will literally change the way it reacts. And so what happens is you get the binge intoxication. And over time, when you use this enough, you're actually going to get a change in this uh, dopamine pathway. And what it is, is that the high levels of dopamine all of a sudden are not being um, absorbed because there's been an actual neural adaptation. The receptors have literally like closed their gates. So only a little bit of dopamine goes through compared to when it was wide open initially. And so what happens is you binge, you don't get the high, you start getting tolerance. And then you think, I got to quit. And when you try to quit, then this word hyper, I can't even say it right. Hyper cataphoria is actually, it just means really, really uh, strong emotions. And yes. if you've ever seen anybody in, um, in withdrawal, they are very miserable. 
and if they have any trauma or any other issues going along, all of a sudden they just become what I like to call a hot mess. Uh, that's a technical term, right? Yes, absolutely. That's a clinical term, right? So, you see it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> in myself. Uh, so anyway, then they get preoccupied with getting the drug. And this part of our brain, this prefrontal cortex, is the part that would say, Meg, you know, maybe better lay off the, um, you know, the frosting because it makes you feel sick if you eat too much. But it's literally like after there has been a neuroadaptation, like there is a pillow and it's like, stop, stop, <laughs> but it can't hear it. It's like this pathway has been hijacked and literally all of a sudden ice cream, a hug, a joke, any of that stimulus does not give enough dopamine to even register. And so what happens is they become solely focused on getting the drug and this cycle goes on ad nauseum. So it isn't personal when somebody has crossed the line into addiction. It is that their brain has adapted to the high levels of dopamine and now normal things that would make us happy. I loved it. I was watching this TED talk and this uh, speaker said, when I smoked marijuana, initially everything was fun and interesting. But mm. after I smoked marijuana for a while, nothing was fun and interesting. Yes. You know, I mean, I felt like I was all that in a bag of chips when I first drank. I mean, I thought I was pretty, pretty cool. And uh, by the time I finally gave up drinking, I mean, I just, nothing was cool especially me do you relate to that yes absolutely and and i love what you're saying here right because this is how um addiction can be about anything right isn't that yes. why there's over a hundred and some 12 step programs absolutely. right so i find something that does this for me whatever that might be and then it it gives me a feeling and I need more of it and more of it. Yes. Right. To the point that now it's the only thing I can think about when I don't have it. Yes, exactly. And gambling, sex, you know, money, job. Yes. Work was a big one for me. Work is a big one. Work is a big one. And, you know, it's interesting how anything that changes the way we feel, you know, it's like, I mean, for me, what makes me feel the best is the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's why I'm a Christian, because for me, the Holy Spirit is the bomb. And that is what gives me that warm, uh, joyful feeling that I would get from a drink or from shopping. But it's not nearly as quick. <laughs> it right. doesn't have, you know, initially it isn't turned on. And so this is why, you know, I found it so frustrating because, you know, here I have an addiction that's a disease, but unlike diabetes, which is what I'm comparing it to here, I couldn't take some insulin to get better, right? right. I, I mean, they really are the same thing. First of all, genetics plays a huge role in addiction. They say about 50% of uh, addiction is... Uh, predisposition is caused by genetics. Same thing with diabetes, caused by overindulgence. They mm -hmm. change the way the brain feels. They make us uh, depressed and they have um, physical side effects. So they really are the same things. But for diabetes, I can get insulin. For addiction, not so much. Plus addiction is, as we know, messy. I don't know anybody who ever got a DUIM, you know, driving while under the influence of McDonald's, you know, <laughs> but I know I got, I never got one, thank God, but I know a lot of people who don't have their license because they were driving while under the influence. They've hurt other people. Yes. Did you get a DUI? I've had several. Oh, you, you went for the several. Across, different, across <laughs> different states even. You go, Brian. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is like my family, though, was so worried about I was always 
drinking and driving. So I deserved one. I really did. I mean, in fact, I had not one, but two corkscrews in my glove compartment because you never know when you need to open a bottle mm. of wine while driving, right? You know, I mean, who doesn't have corkscrews? Just shows uh, this is definitely an insane disease. Well, and that's the other part about it, right? When you talk about addiction as opposed to diabetes as a disease, mm -hmm. right? We, one thing we talk about in the rooms all the time is if I'm allergic to selfish, shellfish, <laughs> I don't find myself sneaking off to the bathroom to eat it. Yeah. Right? And and I think where, we're, where you're moving into with the spiritual part of this or, or the other aspects um, of alcohol addiction and even drug addiction, right, is that idea that I know it's going to harm me. Yes. But I can't stop doing it. Yeah. Right? I need to sneak off to the bathroom or out to the garage or, you know, tell my girlfriend, hey, I'm going to go drive to the store because we forgot milk. Right. So I can get another one. And that's the fascinating part about this. Yeah. And I mean, I love um, Brandon Novak um, is a skating board, like was a skating board superstar. And wasn't he? He was part of Jackass, right? He was a jackass guy, yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, not my genre, but anyway, um, it, we, um, uh, I've seen his um, personal testimony. And one of the things that he says is, you know, it, it's not personal, it's business. You know, he says, you know, I, I want to help my mom, but I just can't because you know what? I'm not the one in control. My disease says jump and I say how high. And boy, mm -hmm. do I relate to that. And I mean, that's how I felt at the end was like, it didn't matter if I was, my husband wanted to leave me or I was putting my job in jeopardy. I, I just, I would cry. I would literally cry going in to buy, because Food Lion's my drug dealer, uh, to buy my Chardonnay. <laughs> I would literally cry and, but still have to go in. Yes. It, it's just, I just want people out there to know that if you have a loved one who is suffering and they have hurt you, they've stole from you, they've done something. It is not who they are. They are not bad people trying to get good. They are sick people who need to get well, and they can't do it alone. And that's because addiction is also a mental illness. So uh, mental illness is defined as a condition which causes a serious disorder in a person's behavior or thinking. And isn't that what we're just talking about? Yep. I mean, here I am crying, but I'm going in to buy it anyway. If that isn't disordered thinking, I don't know what it is. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide, but I just wanted people to see that uh, it literally is, got to go back, um, as mental health professionals, we have a, uh, we call it the DSM-5, but it's how we diagnose mental illness. And there is a whole section on addiction. This is what we look at. If somebody were to come in and say they had a problem with alcohol, we would go through uh, the problematic pattern, tolerance, and withdraw and see how they compare. And I think an easier way, and what I did initially when I went to get sober, is I went to AA's website. Mm. Did you take this quiz when you tried to get sober? You know what? I didn't. I kind of believe what the big book talks about on page four or forty or on page forty-four, Meg. What's it say on forty-four? It asks us two questions. <laughs> if when you want to stop drinking, you find you cannot quit entirely. Yeah. Or once you start, you find you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. Yes. And that is the easiest way, I think, for us to self-diagnose if we're honest with ourselves. Absolutely. Yep. If you want a few more questions, so I went and took this assessment, and I think I answered yes to almost all of them. Yes. So um, this is also on our um, on my YouTube page. So if you want to take a self assessment or pass it on to somebody as maybe a subtle, honey, maybe you might want to check this out. Uh, that would be a way for you to do it. Just be ready. They're probably going to buck at you, and they're probably going to you know get defensive. 
Yes, absolutely. Because you know, and addicts and addict people in addiction do not want to talk about. It. No, we do not. And you know, uh, advice when given without asking is criticism. Uh, so, um, something that I've learned the hard way from my children. <laughs> so, um, before we go into the myths being busted, you know, let's talk about this mind spirit, body, nature of addiction. It really is all three. Don't you think, Brian? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. you know, I was trying to think myself sober, which somebody pointed out to me. I was trying to fix my broken brain with my broken brain, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? But that's what I would do. I would think I could just figure this out I could stop doing it but the reality is I couldn't figure it out I couldn't think myself into sobriety I had to go to AA and they said you have to act yourself into right thinking which made no sense to me but right. when you when you think about like a stroke victim the way they recover is they change the way their brain um, fires by doing exercise. And in some ways, we have to do the same thing. We have to take direction and, and physically do different behaviors to get ourselves, you know, able to think differently, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, and we did the same thing going into our addiction, right? The first time I started drinking, now I do believe I have a physical allergy to alcohol, but let's say if it was something else that I can find myself addicted or, or trouble in, I had to act my way into that. Yeah. Right. So the first time I did it, I probably could have stopped if I would have went, oh, that's a problem. But after doing it enough, it had rewired and my acting had changed my behavior. Right. Um, so I think we got to do the same thing to get out of it. Yeah. And so our, uh, our mentor loves behavioral therapy he's all about behaviorism and um you know i think that's why one of the things that we struggle with now is that we want a pill to fix us yes. you know and this is not something that necessarily a pill can fix um in fact i have yet to see anybody fixed by a pill it is something that is it takes other people to help you to show you the way right to show you how to act differently, to hold your hand when you want to give up, um, and to help you find your way back into living life the way you want to live your life, which was yeah, not, with integrity. I'm sorry, Maddie. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm sure you will tackle this on a different one. There are some times where pills are needed, right? There's yeah. um, some mental health challenges that we can have where – you know, I need it to um, replace something that I'm missing in my brain, right? So antidepressant, antipsychotic, yes. or just something that can help. But I think when you ask me the question about the mind, body, spirit, and nature of addiction, um, I really buy into what the big book says. And, and just so anyone who's not familiar with the program, um, it is written with biblical beliefs. And very much so. It's not a new concept of its own. And the book says we get right spiritually, mentally, and then physically. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in that order. And I think the reason why that probably is because human beings are spiritual by nature. Yeah. And of humans from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ways of faith and religion have created a stability that's innate in us and so mm -hmm. i think the idea is we get right spiritually right it gives us this individual a framework a hope yep. and allows us to become open-minded to the power of god which is really what we find is so crucial in aa yep. um and then defining this power becomes less of what's important at this stage you know, because religion has been the cause of wars, genocide, even division within cultures. And so um, we really have mean, where can I find this power in God? 
And um, as a Christian, that was difficult for me at first, mm -hmm. you know, but but I think I just needed to be open-minded first. Yep. Yeah, like we started with in the beginning, you know. That's it. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing that, I mean, there's so many things that, that I have found in sobriety, but the thing that I found the most is that being able to be uh, open and intimate with God and my fellows, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the joy is. It didn't come from promotions. It didn't come from a bottle of wine. It didn't come from looking a certain way. It really came from the relationship with God and my fellows. And I, and I tell people all the time when I'm working with them, that's where the joy is. And, yeah. and unfortunately, we live in the shadows of shame and sin. It helps us to stay there because we feel guilty. And so, you know, uh, is addiction a disease? It is. Even though some people may not like that, the reality is it matches up perfectly. Um, and I actually um, have pictures of uh, how the neuron itself is changed. It's, I mean, these are little pictures of the brain's receptors and it shows how it changes it. So uh, is it a mental illness? Well, all you have to do is listen to me talk <laughs> about my experience to go, yeah, that's a mental illness. Absolutely. It is definitely a mental illness. And is it a sin? Well, like you said in the beginning, we're not going to solve that one here. Um, it's really based on how you feel about it. And I think, I think that's where it needs to be. But even if you believe it's a sin, don't let your shame keep you hiding because the way addiction wins is by us not talking about it, by us hiding and uh, keeping everything in the secret. So it is not a shame to ask for help. And there is lots of help out there. In fact, on the YouTube page, you will see there is several different websites that you can reach out based on what kind of help you need. So please... Um, you know, we're going to, our next show is going to be actually talking about treatment um, because there's a lot of what treatment does what and um, what is treatment. So we're going to be talking about some of the myths about a treatment in our next segment. But uh, in the meantime, uh, please share this information. Um, go ahead and join the YouTube page and I will be able to send you um, a link for the new show. Brian, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you've been a tremendous help, and I could not have done it without you. So thank you. Well, Meg, I just appreciate you opening up a topic like this. Um, it just needs to be talked about. It does. It does. And um, I felt called, and thank you for giving me the strength to do it. So anyway, God bless everybody. Mm -hmm.